All right, welcome to another episode of the Veteran Foodie Podcast, where the mission is to educate the military-connected food and beverage entrepreneur to spotlighting other entrepreneurs who share their business experience and their advice. Uh, we got a super special guest, Marine Veteran Joseph Zaleta on here, who runs Black Six Coffee Trading Company, as well as the Black Six Project, which which uh, has a really great mission I'm excited to dive into. So wel- welcome to the show, Joe. Hey, Stephen. Thanks for having me on here. Finally, <laughs> we get a chance to get 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 this recorded. Exactly, man. You're like, and you're like Superman right now. You just ripped off your paramedic uh, outfit, so it's. I'm glad you could get some time away. You know. <laughs> I know. I know. After this, it's a uh, it's a uh, father husband time. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. That mm-hmm. makes sense. That's cool, though, man. So yeah, Joe. So we were just talking about it. You're you're a Marine veteran. So how how long were you in the Marines for, anyways? I was uh, in the Marines for four years. I went active duty in 2002, and then I got out in 2006. Okay. What What was your job while in the Marines? Uh, my MOS was, a, I was a 0311. I was a rifleman, uh, and, and I was assigned with uh, Golf Company, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines in Camp Pendleton. Where is that at? For, uh, for oh, uh, Camp here? Pendleton, California, Southern California, California. around uh, San Diego. Nice. Beautiful area. I love San Diego. Yeah, that's, that's I know. I never got cities. to visit. Yeah, I uh, wouldn't have had a chance to visit if I didn't go in the Marines. Nice man. We we used to pull in there all the time because I was stationed over in like Alameda in the Bay Area, San Francisco. Oh, Bay Alameda area. is nice. So we mm-hmm. we pull right into San Diego all the time, and we'd see uh we'd see a lot of Marines and Navy guys, and then like all the SEALs train in their helicopters and stuff. It's kind of mm-hmm. it was a cool experience, you know. It was unique, just neat. Yeah, I always uh, said that if I got to move out of new york i would choose san diego yeah yeah it's mm-hmm. nice over there that's a that's a cool cool unit nice though man so uh all right so so your business man uh, i mean we've ran out into each other a few times during uh different networking events and and i had your coffee i think it was a few few months ago nyu was running their uh their panel and uh mm-hmm. you, were, you were the uh coffee host and it's, yeah, it was, it was, it was <laughs> bomb, man. It was, it was fucking good coffee too. It's good, good talking to you. But I'm excited yeah, to have it was you good on. to get together at that oh, time. Yeah. It's been a while since we got to do events like that. Absolutely, it's the it's the mm-hmm. bread and butter, you know. Like Zoom is nice, but obviously in person is way better. But yeah, uh, hopefully we get more chances like that. Yeah, absolutely. So why, why give me a, give me the summary of your your business? Yeah, so we started Black Six Coffee Trading Company back in 2018. Uh, but before that, we were uh, doing a nonprofit organization that we started in 2017 called Black Six Project. And that started uh, pretty much in the EMS garages of New York City. Me and another fellow veteran, David Guzman, were on ambulance together. Pretty much our first time working together, we started uh, reminiscing about our time in the military. David Guzman was a uh, uh, Navy corpsman uh, was deployed to Fallujah, so and I was deployed to Ramadi. So we talked about like the the neighboring cities in Iraq. So we, we were mostly talking about the things that we missed, things that we loved about the military, and it sort of brought us to um, the idea of like having service after the military, but without all the dangers and guns and explosions that we we experienced, we still love to uh, provide aid to people. Um, Of course, uh, David was in the medical part. I was in the infantry side. So uh, we talked about things that we really missed too, were like the mission planning and doing and being uh, away from home and seeing different uh, parts of the world. So after a few more days, we started talking to other uh, co-workers who, you know, weren't really veterans too, but also talked about things that, you know, they wish they could do. And a lot of them talked about doing humanitarian work. And we pretty much then said, you know what, we've had these experiences uh, in our time in the military where we uh, sat down, planned out a mission, carried out the mission. Uh, you know, it would be a shame for that to go to waste. So we decided to take the the need or want of our coworkers to do humanitarian work and uh, package it together with our ability to plan missions. So that's when we decided to create the Black Six Project. And uh, we were planning to do humanitarian work initially, and then Hurricane Maria hit, and we ended up 
uh, switching it really quick to do a disaster relief for so our first disaster relief mission was to uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, we, we split our teams into two. We, we had very little equipment. So David went was the first team in. He was pretty much like the recon team. And then uh, through satellite phones, uh, he would call back every night and give us like a, a sit rep on what's going on over there, what we needed when we followed up and pretty much the day he landed, we swapped equipment, and then it was like my team to go, my my turn to go with my team over there, and uh, it was just like a powerful experience, uh, you know, like going about your own way, thinking of how to solve different problems, uh, and the biggest thing was like accessing more re- remote communities. We weren't attaching ourselves to big disaster relief organizations. And uh, we didn't stay in the major cities. Our goal was to reach areas that didn't have opportunities to go to the main city to get resources. We, our goal was to make it to the cities that weren't getting help because of uh, geographical barriers or even just like uh, economic barriers. So we either drove, hiked, uh, just to make it to those uh, people and neighborhoods. So that's how we start off as a nonprofit. Now, how we got into coffee, it was somewhat, somewhat like a similar uh, situation. There was a town in the Philippines called Kibungan that had a typhoon hit it. This is part of the northern part of the Philippines, a uh, more mountainous area than uh, I was used to. I always thought Philippines was full of, full of uh, beaches, but there's actually like uh, tall mountains over there. So this typhoon hit this village and it created a landslide because of you know the, it's, it's mountainous region mm-hmm. and we went up there with about four medics and started helping with the search and rescue gave out water filters uh solar power flashlights medical supplies and while we were there um my favorite thing is to live among the the populace that we have like a full appreciation or understanding of the challenges they're facing so we ended up living on a coffee farm, and wow. yeah, we walk. We asked them if we could stay with them here, and then we were walking outside, and we see all these cherries. We're like, "Hey, what is this?" And uh, they told us it's coffee, and uh, that pretty much like changed everything because I've never seen coffee on a tree before. Meanwhile, almost all my adult life, we were drinking coffee. So I never got to see where it was from until then. And uh, from there, we, we were just like amazed by it. And they had processed about like 50 pounds of coffee left. So the, when it's processed, they usually leave it in what they call the green bean phase, which is where the coffee cherries uh, removed, like the husk of it is removed. And then the bean or seed in the middle is what remains and dried. And that's just the next step after that is it getting roasted. And while we were there, I was also uh, field testing a backpack. Uh, I don't know if you know Backpacks for Life. Oh, yeah. Uh, I ran into them about like two, three weeks before. I asked them, hey, can I try out your backpack? Uh, if anything, I'll take some awesome pictures for you. Cool. And uh yeah i threw those 50 pounds of green coffee in that backpack started hiking it off the mountain with our team and you know just kept it in there and then flew it back in the overhead compartment of the plane i remember boarding the plane i'm trying to lift these 50 pounds into the overhead compartment i get it in there (laughs) and the the flight attendant's like oh let me help you and she tries to lift the door closed and she's like what is in there and I was just like, uh, bowling supplies. <laughs> so we finally get it closed and we're like, oh man, that that backpack was able to hold uh, all that coffee all the way uh, from the mountains and then back to New York City. And when we got it back, I, I was researching how to roast coffee. And then I didn't know there was like this whole other community of people just roasting their own coffee at home, uh, home roasters. So I learned how to do that. Uh, then I called up some of uh, my friends who are like, I would say coffee snobs, asked them to come over for coffee. 
I shared it with them and they were all like, whoa, where's this coffee from? And I was like, hey, remember I just came back from the Philippines? They're like, yeah, this is from the Philippines. And they're like, I never knew coffee grew there. I was like, I didn't know either. But we, we were just there on that trip and just like lived on the coffee farm. And then the idea came where like maybe we could sell this. And we created a website uh, and that coffee sold on that website within like a week. Then I knew like, hey, this is something that we can try to do. We're, we're planning to go to other coffee growing countries. Why don't we do a medical mission there, source some coffee, and then uh, use those funds to do more medical missions. So that's pretty much like how our model started was trip, humanitarian aid, grab some coffee, head back, plan the next one. And that's how we decided to create the Black Six Coffee Trading Company. Wow. That's a pretty incredible story right now. It seems like a lot of vets who run their own business have some kind of core mission to help others, but it seems like you started with the core mission and it evolved into the business, which is, is kind of neat. And I, I don't hear as often, which is um, pretty, pretty incredible. You know, that's, that's pretty cool. How, how, did, yeah. how did it go when, mm-hmm. uh, when, when David first went over to the PR and he started scouting out these remote villages, did you guys have contacts over there or did he just start you know, sit down at like a bar and start meeting people or how, how did that go? Oh, yeah. So David is actually Puerto Rican, oh, okay. which made it a lot easier. So yeah. he called up like relatives that were in the affected area or mm-hmm. just outside and they helped house the team. And then after that, he like drove around those areas, uh, helping people out with supplies, connected with other people, trying to help others that were local. I think we connected with a, with a church over there in uh, Arecibo. And then they're like, oh, you bring another team. We'll, we'll let them stay with us. So when we landed there, uh, we moved to the church. And they're like, oh, we're kind of like embarrassed. We have to sleep here. And we're like, no, we'll sleep on the floor anywhere. And they ended up housing us at the lo- local police precinct. And like these bunk beds, and which was pretty awesome too. I was like, "Hey, you didn't have to go that far." We we bought tents. Think we were just gonna sleep in someone's yard. They're like, (laughs) "No, it's kind of embarrassing. We do that for you." Like, no, we were we were ready for it. So that's that's how we. And that's the advantage of living in in New York. It's like someone knows someone in Mm -hmm. like that country. And that's how we pretty much got into all these other coffee growing countries. Like I, we had we know someone that knows someone that wrote that hosts us. That's nice. So you guys got some luxury luxury accommodations compared to what you were going into it with, which is uh, yeah, which is nice. That's that's cool. Some some of the team members have never like gone on deployment. They were like really anticipating. They were excited for it, and then they got bunk beds, and they're like, "Oh no, this isn't what I was looking for. I was thought we were going to be like in a in a grassy field or something." Like, no, this is what we got in like air conditioning like oh, i can't believe you have air conditioning i was like yeah me too <laughs> yeah it's like a vacation <laughs> yeah that's, exactly exactly that's funny though that's 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 amazing though that's that's incredible you guys were able to help out like that and that's that's interesting you guys chose to go to the remote portions that the bigger uh organizations weren't probably getting to as much so i'm sure people really appreciated that mm-hmm. interesting so, so once you launched your website and you sold out of this coffee in a week, how, how'd you get the word out about the website? How, how'd that go? Uh, we just went on social media. Um, I, we already had the social media presence with the Black Six Project. So we started sharing like, hey, we sourced this coffee, uh, check out the website, buy some of the roasted coffee that we bought back. Uh, and then we're, we were saying, we're going to use some of the funds to fund the, the next mission. And I think er, people who were already following the nonprofit was like, uh, they, they were sharing it. And I think the, the word spread pretty quickly. That's great. Curious mm-hmm. too. So once you guys started selling the coffee and it, it steamrolled, and I guess what were the next steps to legitimizing that and making it more of a process to get that coffee over? Or did you keep going over and putting it in the overhead bin like that? Uh, we kept on doing that. Yeah, we kept nice. on doing that. Or, um, like one of our uh team members, he's our videographer. He was he's been like uh my high school friend, and he does like the trips with us and captures all the the video footage. One of the things he likes to do is like uh go on these motorcycle adventures, 
So one of the trips he went back, and this was probably the best way to get it off the mountain, was he would ride his motorcycle up uh, into that that village up the mountain. It's about like from Manila, it might be like a 10-hour drive. Oh, wow. But he might cut off like four hours of it because he could go through traffic and mm-hmm. then the ability to make it up the mountain a lot more easily because of he's just by himself. The vehicle's not that big. Mm-hmm. Um, got him up there quicker. Uh, then he would put him on like saddlebags. It'll be him and like two other relatives that travel with him. He'll put him on saddlebags and then drive it off the mountain. And then when he returns home, he would put it in, in his luggage. It was, I called badass. it the, the modern mule. <laughs> the modern mule. I like that. Yeah. That's pretty badass. Yeah. Make yeah, sure. yeah. It, cool. You, know, you got to figure out your ways. So, and then the same thing with, uh, like when we went to Colombia, Guatemala, it was like that. We would take luggage full of donations, medical supplies, and when we would empty them out, we would use the same baggage to to store the coffee and uh, roll it back. That's pretty. That's pretty amazing, right there. That's that's mm-hmm. badass. People are tasting yeah. some some coffee from. Uh... Wow, what a, what a journey! That's cool. <laughs> Very cool, man. Awesome. It is. Mm-hmm. So so throughout uh throughout the process of building the business, expanding, selling more coffee, what's uh what are some big hurdles you guys have faced, and you know how'd you overcome them? Um, I think one of them is then, I, I guess differentiating ourselves as a as a coffee company, um, and then also educating where the coffee comes from. Uh, what we're looking for is really not your, your typical like uh, Folgers or like a Dunkin' Donuts. But we're look, we're trying to source high quality specialty coffee. So um, we're looking for coffee that has like no defects, uh, has a certain color to it, and then when you roast it, it doesn't have these like bad tasting notes that you know force you to put half and half or dairy into your into your coffee or add sugar. So uh, from there, it's like people were, you know, edu- we had to educate them what kind of what we're trying to do with, with coffee, like trying to bring back the highest quality coffee. And then you know, people are then questioning times of like the cost of coffee. But then, you know, back then I kind of questioned it too. But then I realized the labor it takes just to get one coffee bean grown the majority of these countries maybe i I would say only one country uh, out of all the coffee growing countries they hand harvest all their coffee wow so so it is very labor intensive and it really justifies the cost of coffee Mm -hmm. so it's education like that and then i would say um that like from that from education then that that's where i felt like we kind of had to set that's how we set ourselves apart from other uh, companies because we kind of started that origin. It wasn't like, I'm going to start a coffee company while in New York. No, we kind of ended up in the coffee farm and then we're like educated by it. So it was, and I, I won't say it was a challenge, but it also accelerated us in credibility in the, in the coffee roasting industry. Uh, a lot of coffee roasters I met along the way, uh, they would see the coffee you bring in. They're like, oh, where did you get that? And I would say, especially the Filipino coffee, they're like, where did you get this? Like, I've never seen this. And I said, oh, I just came back from the coffee farm. And I learned that a lot of these coffee roasters never actually been to a coffee farm. Huh. So I was, and, and I thought that was a normal process of hmm. coffee roasting. You know, people go to a coffee farm, they they learn about the the production aspect and it makes them a better coffee roaster. So there's like coffee roasters that I was meeting that's been doing it for like twelve years and they've never been to a coffee farm. Wow. So no kidding. So, huh. so when I went I started going to coffee roasting classes, I was able to they the instructor actually would have me talk about our experiences because uh they they've never gone to what they call origin where you know they get the coffee so they're like all right would you be able to say a few things about like how, why the coffee is like this 
why is the productions like this? I was like, oh yeah. So when we were in Guatemala, this was like this, or when we we're in Colombia, it was like this, or when we were in Haiti, it was like this. So that that kind of accelerated us uh, a lot faster in the coffee roasting industry. Yeah, it's so interesting. I would have assumed what you did too and thought that most coffee roasters would visit it, kind of like a farm-to-table business would, you know, know what their chicken's yeah. names are, you know? Um, that's interesting. Yeah. Huh, mm-hmm. So so when you guys aren't excavating mountains and driving motorcycles to go get your coffee, what's the <laughs> typical day in the life look for you running the business? Um, so it's a lot of it is definitely sales. Coffee is a... Um, market saturated industry that's why i say the challenge is really um differentiating yourself telling the story and also uh get get buy-in from from customers who want to try it like why are why should i buy coffee from you but then it's it's really telling the story of like how we got this coffee and a lot of them really are excited about that uh, and then also the coffee roasting operation. Most of our um, coffee is ordered online. So it's just managing the website, uh, getting the orders in, uh, gathering the coffee that we need. Because we, our our model is, uh, uh, we call it order, you order it, and then we roast it. it we don't want to keep it in the roasted state too long because it starts degrading pretty quickly. So yeah, I always like give the analogy of like, did you ever like uh, make toasted bread? Mm-hmm. And then if you don't eat it right away, you let it sit, it becomes like, it loses flavor pretty quickly and it becomes mm-hmm. stale. Uh, it doesn't have the same crunch. Same thing coffee, you're putting through a lot of temperatures and and eventually it'll start degrading uh, itself too. So our I will always want to send the freshest coffee a lot of people who have our coffee for the first time, they're like, oh, where did you get this like high caffeine coffee? It's like, it really doesn't have a lot of caffeine. We just like uh, work on our roasting process. And what you're getting is also the freshest batch. It could be two, three days, mostly because of shipping. But once you, it, you have the, ca- the caffeine, it's pretty quality once you drink it. So it's, it's, not, it's not too different it's just it's it's very very fresh yeah and then talking about our roasting process we uh experiment in like five different roasting profiles Hmm. and then we sample each one and see which one's the best we may tweak the temperatures a little bit or uh the length of time it roasts but we're trying to develop the the taste that's most unique to the coffee and my philosophy in that is not to over roast the coffee, we want to keep some of the, the sugars in there, uh, trap some of the oils in there that give it get, that give the coffee its characteristics. So yeah, I could always burn coffee and every coffee will taste the same, but each coffee kind of has its own personality that I look for. Love that. That's so that's so interesting. I'm a huge coffee drinker, like probably ninety nine percent of veterans are. Um, yes. so I love hearing about the process. So in depth like this, how, how many cups of coffee do you guys drink when you guys are doing the tasting? What oh, so think? the, they call the process cupping, uh, you're to make it through a long cupping session. It's just like wine tasting. You're really not going to be, uh, <laughs> drinking it. You may spit it out, but sometimes, okay. you know, I just, Kind of like the coffee, I might drink it, and then sometimes, uh, I'm sort of uh, I'm done already after, like uh, three or four cups of it. Yeah, fair. Yeah, fair enough. That's, that's yeah. good. Uh, I know when I when I used to work on the Coast Guard ships, like if we were running out of coffee or even close to it, we had like two hundred guys on the ship. Like I probably would have been thrown overboard if we ever actually ran out, but we've came close a few times. <laughs> maybe nobody knows. Maybe they're hearing for the first time. Like especially when we're sailing up in the Arctic. Like we we're probably down to maybe like I don't know. I want to say twenty, thirty bags, and you know we go into a deployment with like five hundred bags or something like that. But um, people would lose their shit if we lost coffee. <laughs> yeah, let's just let's just start adding a little bit more water to it. 
Yeah, exactly. Make it last a little bit longer. One hundred percent. Definitely one of some of the mess cooks used to just keep running it. You know, they they wouldn't change it. They keep pressing the filter or the yeah. the water button. I feel like yeah, fucker. I caught one just of them doing that going. one time. Yeah, but you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> yeah, no one's gonna know, especially when they're like upset. Exactly. Little, you know? This is a little bit is what they need. Oh yeah, man. I remember we actually mm-hmm. we ran out of hot sauce in one deployment, and I thought they were gonna mute me. <laughs> No, oh, yeah, sauce, that's a big one too. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, I remember de- being deployed. I would like keep my own little bottle of hot sauce mm. just in case uh, it runs out somewhere else. Got it. What's what's go to hot sauce for you? Uh sriracha. Ooh, I love sriracha. Yeah, Sriracha's bomb. it's not super spicy, but it has this flavor that I really like. Yeah, yeah that's good. I especially mm-hmm. love it for breakfast, but uh, that's cool. Yeah, with eggs. Yep. Oh yeah, that's the best. Some <laughs> loco moco. Ooh, Ooh uh, yeah, make me hungry. Um, <laughs> cool. Though. So, what, what's your favorite part around the business? Uh, my favorite part probably is like, I would say, tell telling the story of each individual roast or each individual bean, or like, um, how we got it is a is a big thing. Like. One of the the last mission we went on was to Haiti. This was 2021 after the earthquake. And it was also shortly after the prime minister was killed. So we had to kind of like go into Port-au-Prince a little bit more incognito. We stayed in Connex boxes while we were in Port-au-Prince. We had to plan out our route out of there to avoid the the gang violence that was going on and make our way to the south where uh, the earthquake took place. So we were trying to figure out how we were going to get to the towns that were, that had the gang violence. We were, and it's kind of, it was like a funnel, the, the path. There was a mountain that you can't go over because there's no roadways. And then to the right was uh, the sea. So you really got to go through there. So we, we eventually decided to catch a plane and we were supporting a bunch of Haitian doctors or uh, Haitian doctors and medical students uh, to get over there. So we flew together over there uh, and landed in the more farmland country to the south. And uh, it was pretty awesome. We went up the mountains, uh, hiking about like four four miles up, four miles down along the water, uh, carried everything we need to use on our on our backs, we did a lot of stitching up there, antibiotics, uh, splinting. Uh, took care of the doctors who kind of like fell along the trail, um, but then it, and then also sourced the coffee while we were there and uh, took it back. And then it it's sort of a I think it's a I don't, I don't want to call it a secret. It shouldn't be a secret. Haiti makes some seriously good coffee i would compare it to jamaica but it just needs to expand and also give it uh it's uh, availability in the market and i would say it it would be a great coffee producing country that's great i mean i can tell you enjoy telling the story of it you like kind of light up as you're telling the story of each uh experience so it's uh it's got to (laughs) sell itself for for a good reason you know you got a great story behind it all so yeah so so with that, we got we got a lot of military connected entrepreneurs listening in, mainly in the food and beverage industry. Probably looking mm-hmm. up to you for, for some advice. What what advice would you have for them? Uh, I would say definitely one of the biggest things, and I think it's a great characteristic of a uh, military veteran, is tenacity. Uh, you just gotta keep pushing forward. Uh, find the path of least resistance, but you gotta push against the resistance to figure that out um, and explore every avenue of opportunity. But that doesn't mean say yes to everything. As you're getting a lot more opportunity, weigh out which one will uh, bring you the most benefit versus time. So th- those are the, 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 the biggest advice and also uh, be open-minded, you know, not everything is just, uh, is straightforward. Nothing, you know, entrepreneurship on its own is not a direct path. So look for different ways to do different things. Cause you may find 
another business that's not doing what you're looking for. So you're like, it, 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 that's also the bad part about entrepreneurship. You're just like, oh, I have another idea, which will open another business. Oh, yeah. And you're like, no, no, stay focused. Yeah. So that that's probably what it's just is keep pushing despite the difficulties. And it, you are your own boss, but you're also that also means you're going to have to work at least five times harder than anybody else to, to succeed. That's, I mean, that's solid advice. I especially like the part about don't forget to say no to certain opportunities that might take your focus away from the main goal. I know I yes. found that out through my own business as well. And it's, it gets tough, but it gets easier and tougher along the way as you grow. Right. So, uh, that's yeah. great advice. It makes a lot mm-hmm. of sense. So, yeah. so for everyone listening in, how, how do we support your business? How do we buy your coffee? How do we support your, the black six project? Tell us about yeah. that. So we're always open for donations for the black six project. You could find a, we are a 501 C three, uh, IRS approved nonprofit. If you want to send some donations, you can go onto our website, which is black6project.org. If you want to buy some coffee, uh, you can check us out at black6coffee.org. Uh, check out the videos uh, that we put together, and you could get a better idea of the, the work we do, uh, the coffee roasting we do, and overall, like, what we're trying to bring as a coffee company as a, and also as a veteran owned organization that's always looking to continue to serve the world. It's great, Joe. It was a, it's been a pleasure, really pleasure hearing about all the mission and uh, you know, it's been great having you on. I'm glad you could join. No, thank you, Stephen. Thanks for having me on. And it's awesome to like uh, know that there's veterans sharing stories like you are. Absolutely. I'm trying to build, build out our community. We're, we're all stronger together as we know. So. So uh, yes. that's great. We all have great stories. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, yeah. Joe. All right, Stephen. Thank you.